I'd like to start with this image. Uh, it expresses the fact that, uh, as you can tell, uh, Eero Saarinen, certainly on July 2nd, 1956, was a very famous man. Uh, then, as now, architects were rarely on the covers of major magazines. And remember, the 50s, there were many fewer magazines. So being on the cover of Time and being an architect on the cover of Time was really an incredible distinction. He was very, very famous in his day. He was also, without doubt, one of the most unorthodox and very controversial architects. And I'll talk about both of those themes tonight. He was both unorthodox and very, very controversial architect who rose to prominence after the Second World War. Interestingly, about 10 years after Sarnen appears on the cover of Time magazine in 1956, he largely disappears from the architectural scene. This man who dominates American architecture and in many ways world architecture after the Second World War largely disappears. And I think there's a few reasons why that is. One is Sarnen in 1961, at the age of 51, dies of a brain tumor. And at that point in time, uh, at the age of 51 and 61, 10 of his most famous buildings, many of which we're going to see tonight, 10 of his most famous buildings were not completed. And as a result, when those buildings were completed and he gained tremendous notoriety and press, he wasn't there. He was the invisible man at the opening of the St. Louis Arch at the opening of the Yale Stiles dormitories, at all the other buildings for which he's very well known, TWA Terminal in New York. Sarnin is invisible, he's not there. He's not able to kind of bask in the glory. At the same time, there's a great shift in the winds of architecture in the late 1960s, early 1970s. A kind of new interest in history, a new interest in being contextual, and Sarnin is to critics, oftentimes accused of being the man who was too bold, he's accused of being arrogant, the buildings stand out too strongly from their backgrounds, and while he's not able at that time to celebrate the buildings that are opening in the earlier 60s, he's sadly not able to be there to counteract either in his words or in his work these criticisms that emerge. So that shortly by the late 60s, early 70s, Sarnin, if you look at architecture books on American architecture or modern architecture, Sarnin is gone. He literally, like a comet, just sort of comes and suddenly disappears. Recently, though, Sarnin's star has certainly been rising. Uh, since the mid-1980s, there is increasing interest in the mid-century modern style, as it's called, the international style, of which Sarnin was a major proponent. That's begun to be more and more interesting to people. It always takes time for something to come back, and the 25-year mark is usually the point. So by the mid-'80s, suddenly there's an interest again in mid-century modern design. At the same time, I was very fortunate to work on a large traveling exhibition. I curated with a few other people, did a big book on Aero Saarinen that traveled throughout Europe and throughout the United States, which generated considerable reassessment in his work that happened a few years ago. His furniture is also ever-present. It's in glossy shelter magazines, and you find it in fashion magazines as backdrops, and you can, of course, buy it at Design Within Reach if you want to, as an online, as a bricks and mortar kind of a store. And finally, another part of the revival of Sarnin is what's happening here at this museum, which is that the museum taking over the Miller House in Columbus, Indiana, which is without a doubt Sarnin's premier domestic piece of architecture, the opening of that house to the public and the press that generated around it has also begun to bring Sarnin back. So all of this seems to be a kind of finally we're catching up. His work remains difficult in many ways. It's difficult to get your arms around it. And that's part of what I want to talk about, what's controversial and what's kind of unorthodox. To begin, though, just a bit of brief, brief background. Eero Saarinen uh, was born in Finland in 1910. And in the mid-1920s, he comes to the United States with his father, a man named Eliel Saarinen. There's always a confusion over the, which one is the father, which one is the son? Uh, Eliel comes with his entire family to Detroit 
and they come in the mid-1920s. And Arrow works with his father and his family throughout the 20s, 30s, and into the 40s. And then, with Eliel's death in 1950, Arrow Sarandon takes on the job of his own office in Detroit. And over the next 10 years, an extremely short period, there's a very short window that Sarandon's on his own. There's 11 years there. He really, more than any other architect of his day, helps to create the international image of the United States with his designs as some of the most potent expressions of American identity. Remember, the Second World War has ended in 1945, and it's a new America. It's a global, modern, behemoth, an American of what Henry Luce, the great publisher who publishes Time Magazine, calls the American century. And Sarnin is in many ways the architect of this American century that Luce describes in about 1941. Luce was the publisher of Time, Look, Fortune Magazine. So in many ways, Sarnin is the architect of that American century. He works in the 1950s for everything that makes, for everyone and everything that makes America modern in the post-war period. He's involved in automobile culture, he's involved in telecommunications, he's involved in television, he's involved in air travel, including jet travel, he's involved in information technology systems, he's helping companies like IBM go global, he's involved in certain acts of suburbanization, and he's even involved in a major way in higher education in America. All those things that make America modern after the Second World War, Eero Sarnin is without a doubt the architect who's spanning all those realms. Now I want to start with a brief resume of four of the projects because I want to talk about the oddity of the work, the diversity of the work. This is a brochure from the General Motors Technical Center it opens in 1956. It's outside of Detroit. It's a technical center that General Motors builds as a research institute. It is the building that actually gets Aero Sarnin on the cover of Time magazine. If you looked at that Time cover, there's a plan behind him. It's the plan of this complex. This was built by General Motors in the mid-50s, and they spent in the mid-50s $100 million on it. Everything was custom designed. The buildings, the landscape, the fountains, the furniture, the doorknobs. Everything was custom designed under the aegis of Aero Saarinen's office. It was described at the time as an industrial Versailles. And that's a key aspect of Saarinen's work. He himself doesn't talk about this, but when the press and when the public relations people go to give it meaning and go to describe it, they oftentimes conflate something American and something European. Because in a way, America, after 1945, is the new Europe, is the new world leader, and in many ways, the American executive, the business executive, is the new Louis XIV, the new aristocrat. And you'll find in a lot of the Sarnin work this conflation, the industrial Versailles, is picked up in the press, and it's part of the meanings that are given to Saarinen's work. The most famous of all the Saarinen buildings is the St. Louis Arch. Uh, it is ironic that it's the first project he wins as a competition in 1948. Uh, as a competition, he wins this. And it's interestingly, it takes so many years to build on the Mississippi River in St. Louis that it's the last building that is completed. It's not done until the mid-1960s, four years after his death. It's one of those 10 buildings I mentioned. We know it today as kind of a symbol of St. Louis, but actually it was meant to celebrate America's westward expansion. It was meant to be a kind of a, a portal between the east and the west part of the country. It's actually on honor of Jefferson and the Louisiana Purchase. So it's a monument that was really a very nationalist symbol. Sarnin wins it in a competition. The story oftentimes told is that his father, who is still alive, applies in the competition. And the letter announcing the winner arrives, and it's addressed to E. Sarnin. And everyone thinks the father has won, and they discover the son has won. 
Another famous building by Saarinen, the TWA Terminal, opens in 1962 at Kennedy Airport. At the same time, he's now going into very sort of strange, organic, biomorphic uh, forms, very sculptural forms he's developing. At the same time he's developing TWA and those concrete forms, organic forms, he's also developing probably his most famous line of furniture, the so-called pedestal furniture, that's ubiquitous now and comes out from the company called Knoll. In many ways, Sarnin designs furniture throughout his entire career, and the furniture is always, it's kind of the buildings in miniature, certain things he's studying in the buildings. He's also studying similar ideas of form or materials in the furniture. So the furniture form a kind of a, another s miniature frequency throughout his entire career. Interestingly, Saarinen is not just a sculpturalist and not just a modernist in the sense of the General Motors uh, technical headquarters. By the mid-50s, he's also going into issues of uh, going into metaphor and historic precedent. So on the left is the Stiles and Morris Colleges at Yale, which is made of this kind of rough stone-like concrete with steps. And Saarinen says, well, it has the kind of old feeling of an Italian hill town. So he, now he's actually referring back to historical models. And on the right is the beautiful chapel at MIT, which has a giant oculus, almost like a Roman, like the Pantheon. And he says that it, in many ways, is, suggests a kind of ancient grottos. So in addition to looking forward, he's also looking backward. Now, to some observers, all of this, by the way, is happening at roughly the same time. He's doing this all pretty much at the same moment. There's almost no progression. He gets most of these jobs after the General Motors Tech Center, gets them on the cover of time, and he's doing it all at the same time. And there's two ways of looking at this. To many of his critics, this is what makes him controversial, this seems to be insanity. It seems to be inconsistency. An artist is supposed to have a signature style. If you think of the architect Mies van der Rohe, the architect is supposed to have a look a signature style that he or she expresses himself with, herself with. Saarinen is not doing this. He's going from one job to another. Every client is getting a slightly different look. It's almost like advertising, and he's been accused of that at the time. People would say, well, it was just sort of the style for the job. He didn't really have a consistent core set of philosophies or aesthetics. Other people, and I think this is more true today than in the past, would look upon what Saarinen was doing as a kind of an expression of American cultural diversity. It was in many ways, it came to represent the kind of post-war American ideal of an open-ended society, of unbounded choice, and of cultural diversity. That America was a place where the individual could be him or herself in the Cold War, unlike in the Soviet Union, and this diversity of style was an expression of our focus on individuality. This is something which dogged Saarinen throughout his entire career and dogged his reception afterwards. And it depends how you look at it. You can either see it as style for the job or you can see it as diversity. Now, what I want to do next is to go through a series of Saarinen buildings and weave together stories of how his buildings were conceived and designed some of the processes by which the buildings were conceived and built was as innovative as the forms. I want to talk about the role that collaboration plays in the creation of the buildings, something which is very contemporary. Architects today are very much forced and oftentimes relish collaboration because of the complexity of buildings. And Sarnin is very much an early example of someone who embraces collaboration. And I also want to talk about, and I've suggested a little bit with the idea of the industrial Versailles, I also want to talk about the meanings that he and others, people like those in the press, oftentimes attach to his buildings. Now, as I mentioned, of all the buildings that he's famous for, the uh, St. Louis Arch is a good example. Here on the left is Sarnen studying the model of it. He's studying it as a piece of sculpture in many ways. Models were extremely important in the Sarnen office. They were oftentimes, uh, first of all, the forms were very unusual, and you needed something very three-dimensional to convince the client to buy these ideas. 
You need something very, very persuasive. And a big model was very persuasive. It was also a way, somebody who worked in the office told me, it was a way for everybody in the office to kind of get involved because the model would sit in the middle of the office and people would walk by and somebody else was working on it and it almost was like a kind of a conversation focus to talk about the building so that it was a way to bring everyone together in the office. On the right is an image of Sarnen studying models of different sizes. But what's most interesting is, look at the drawing behind him on the right. He's drawn a classical arch. It looks like the Arch of Constantine in Rome or the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. He's letting the viewer of this photograph know that he's situating this building in historical forms, the arches of classical Greece and classical Rome. Interestingly, of course, while he's looking back, he's also looking very forward because it's only with the kind of modern engineering that you can build the St. Louis Arch, which is a skyscraper scaled kind of structure, and it's not clad in classical stone, it's clad in the most modern of materials, stainless steel, that almost dematerializes it. And this is another characteristic of Sarnin's work, the looking backward, bringing the best of historical practice from the past forward, but then changing it to make it totally modern, either in scale or in its materials. Now, the St. Louis Arch acted as a kind of a, a symbolic portal. Sarnin also designed real portals, in other words, major airports. He designed the Dulles International Airport outside of Washington, D.C., which interestingly was the first civilian airport built for jet uh, travel. And you'll find in Sarnin's work another theme. He's the first, the biggest, the most this, the thinnest. There's always some kind of superlative technology or form or something attached to the building, which gave the client great satisfaction, but it also generated an enormous amount of press. He was very involved with the media in many ways. He might have shied away but the buildings themselves generated huge press interest. The card below is Eero Saarinen's own card from June 21st, 1958, when he was one of the first civilians who actually flew on a jet aircraft. At that time, they were just military use. Here again, Saarinen has taken something traditional. This is a building outside of Washington. So he's taken the grand stone colonnades of the classical buildings in Washington, D.C. He's turned them into very slim elements in concrete. And then to express the modernity of flight, he's created this great swooping roof that follows in its curve the trajectory of the jet airplane. TWA may look similar to us today. This is 1962. This is a building, if you know the work of Frank Gehry or Zaha Hadid or Santiago Calatrava, these are architects, contemporary architects who are working in these kinds of free forms. In Sarnin's day, <clears throat> this was built without a computer. And you can see in the upper right-hand corner the most remarkable kinds of drawings. This was during the era of slide rules. Uh, near the end of his career, computers were coming in, but TWA was built totally the old-fashioned way. And the drawings are remarkable to see how they figured out the engineering to create these elaborate bird-like curvilinear shapes. This is another building where people would say, well, it's like a bird landing. And Sarnin would always say, well, no, it's not. But it just looks like a bird. And so the question is, did he want you to see that? Or did he not want you to see that? He was always mute on that question. Even the way TWA is built, I mean, look at this is the formwork going up. It looks like some handmade thing being done in the 18th century. This is actually how they built the building with these small sheets of wood. Uh, Sarnin did two. Uh, airports in America, both of which were major portals. One in New York is the portal to the country's cultural and financial capital. Dulles is literally the airport connected to the capital itself. He also did symbols of American identity overseas. He did two embassies, 
both of which the American government is moving out of now due to post-9-11 security issues. The most uh, infamous of the embassies is in London, Grosvenor Square. Uh, he tried to be somewhat contextual, and he made this very unusual uh, uh, sort of gridded facade out of uh, Portland uh, stone, which is that kind of beautiful uh, grayish-beige stone you see all throughout uh, England. But then he moves to a kind of an imperialist move, which the British hated. He puts this giant eagle on top. You know, and Kevin Roach, who is Irish and took over from Sarn and worked with Sarn and senior designer, and as you know, did many buildings in Columbus, Indiana. When we did a public program with uh, Kevin Roach, he said, well, you know, when it came to the American Embassy in London, he said, we could, you know, there was no way we were going to do a building that wasn't going to make the British unhappy because we were expressing American power over the British Empire. He said, we could have done something that would have made them a little less unhappy. <laughs> Sarnin also was the darling of major American corporations, and this on the left is the General Motors headquarters, which you saw the brochure of, the famous Where Today Meets Tomorrow brochure. Uh, here, this is the tech center, done in 1956. Uh, a steel and a glass facade as machined as sleekly as any automobile, and an enormous canopy outside one of the buildings that's got the cantilever of like a 1959 Cadillac tail fin. Sarnan oftentimes worked closely with clients, so closely he oftentimes adapted their technologies to his buildings. And this must have been very flattering to actually see your technologies, if you want to know why the man succeeded, these are some of the reasons why, to see your technologies embedded in the buildings your architects are designing. So in the case of the General Motors Technical Center, it's one of the innovations at the center is the windows are zippered in. In other words, this is a very common technology now. This is the first time this is done. They're zippered in with a kind of a rubber gasket. And this is the technology which Saarinen took from windshields. So he adapted automobile technologies directly into the building, and by doing so, created a building construction technology that is still common today. Uh, this is the office on the right of Harley Earl. Harley Earl was the big GM auto designer, and Earl was going to have nothing but the most dramatic. So his office is all made of these great kind of curving pieces of built-in furniture. And in many ways, if you look at even the, the Sarnin's archive is at Yale, you'll find in the archive photographs like the one on the left. Interestingly, the desk that was made for Harley Earl was mocked up initially in clay and sculpted just the way auto bodies are sculpted. So again, another kind of process from the automobile industry is adapted to the interior furnishings of the building. Uh, Sarnin worked with IBM at a pivotal moment in the company's history. This is the mid-1950s. This is the moment when Thomas Watson Sr., the founder of the company, has died, and Thomas Watson Jr. is taking over. And the son wants to put his impact, his imprint, on the company. At the same time, the company's technology is changing. It's going from the, the punch card technology. Those of you of a certain age remember those punch cards. Uh, they're going from paper punch card technology to the electronic, punch, the electronic uh, computing technology that we have today. So there's a major shift happening in the dynasty of the Watsons, but there's also a shift in the technology, and the company is becoming the IBM that we know for its electronic computing. Uh, Thomas Watson decides to create a giant rebranding of the company and hires new graphic designers, architects, exhibition designers to kind of rebrand the company. Everything is redesigned from the stationery to the machines to the showrooms to the buildings. And Sarnin is hired as the first architect of this giant rebranding campaign. And the first building he builds is the IBM facility in Rochester, Minnesota. This is the first IBM building outside the East Coast. 
So it's really the beginning of the globalization of the international business machines company. Here the technology is the world's thinnest wall. It's only one and five sixteenth inch thick. It's made of kind of an aluminum panel with a kind of an asbestos interior. And it's a classic American notion of defying nature. This is Minnesota, and it doesn't work. <laughs> it's too cold, and it's too hot. So it doesn't work. It has to be retrofitted, but it gets Sarn and an IBM an awful lot of press. It's also one of the first times that because the technology is so new, this very thin glass and aluminum wall, it's very thin. It requires a full-scale mock-up. So on the right is the completed building, and on the left is the mock-up that was built to study the, the, uh, the structure. And as I said, it needed to be retrofitted because it was just energy, completely energy inefficient. Uh, another great Sarnin building was done for the Deer headquarters in Moline, Illinois. Uh, this is the first use of Corten steel, which is now ubiquitous. Corten steel had been used for like railroad ties and roads, road construction, uh, you know, like guardrails. It had never been applied to architecture. Uh, in the Sarnin office was a man named John Dinkaloo, who really was the technological genius. Sarnin would say, I'd like to build a building that fits in with its landscape, that has the kind of rustic feeling of a tree bark. And it would be John Dinkaloo who would say, well, let's try doing it in Corten. So this is the first use of Corten steel. The building was also interpreted by the press as a kind of English country house. And it's difficult to see in this photograph, but what we discovered was, you can see on the left, in working on the show, we discovered, if you look at the left, they're citing the building. And it's, a far, it's farmland. There are no trees. There is no lake. So this notion that he was building a building that fit with the landscape is actually the reverse. They built a building because they thought it looked beautiful, and they built a landscape around it. And they brought in all the trees, the lakes, the grasses, the hills. Everything was totally man-made. And if you go to this, you will see something quite interesting. You do approach it the way you do approach an English country house, and that you see it in the distance, you take a series of curving roads, it disappears, and all of a sudden, it appears in front of you. And in many ways, this was interpreted by the press as, this is how the American executive this is the American example of the English country house, the way General Motors was the industrial Versailles. The man standing next to Sarn and in the photograph, the man pointing is the last uh, deer who was head of the company, the last family member. Closer to home, Columbus, Indiana, three Sarn and buildings. The father has other buildings, but Aero Sarn and himself on his own has three buildings. One of them is the Irwin Bank. Uh, it has these, this very flat uh, roof, but it has these domes, uh, uh, little sort of like classical domes, uh, that when you're inside, you can see sort of like little uh, sort of domes from ancient Rome. Uh, the town dubbed it the Brazier Factory. And it's also, this is his interest in automobile culture. The building is designed, it's supposed to be, and it's reportedly true, that it's the first drive-in bank teller window. Another company Sarnin works for is Bell Labs. This was the great innovative company. Bell Labs, which creates things like the transistor. For this company, we get the world's biggest mirror. This is the world's first use of mirrored glass, something which I'm sure many of us regret. But this is the first use of mirrored glass. And again, there's an attendant amount of publicity around the first. And finally, he works with Frank Stanton and William Paley at CBS to do the CBS headquarters. Uh, talk about branding and architecture. There was a scheme to actually put the CBS logo on top of the building. I assume this never happened. Uh, but it was an initial idea that they would actually brand the building with the actual logo onto it. So my idea of 
the closeness of client and architect is such that he actually would put the logo on top. Sinan also did a lot of schools. And remember, in 1944, the GI Bill is passed. And the GI Bill allows a lot of returning veterans to go to college. And there's a huge increase in college enrollment. And there's a lot of new buildings being built. Also, women are going to college increasingly more after the war. And many of Sarnan's buildings are girls' dormitories. And that's the reason why, because there's an increase in the female population. At Yale University, he does the Styles and Morse colleges. Uh, this is a building which was much criticized because it was never finished as planned. If you look at the photographs on the right, uh, maybe I can. These are the buildings. The only parts, this is the gym. The original idea was to take like an Italian, uh, like the Campo in Siena, and create a kind of piazza in front of the gymnasium and then have a group of semicircular buildings to create a kind of amphitheater, a place where the students could gather and could come together. It was a way to create a sense of community on the campus. As it turns out, not all the buildings are finished. And there's also, they never closed the street. So therefore, when you go and see it now, it seems half done, it seems half baked, and that's because it is. Only half of it was ever fully completed. And the full urban scheme of creating a kind of a piazza, an Italian piazza, was never realized. Sarnin is also in many ways involved in certain aspects I mentioned earlier of suburbanization. As America is suburbanized after the Second World War, there needs to be new churches built in suburban areas. And many of the designs of these churches are very different. They don't have the kind of long nave. They become more open and more centralized. In the Catholic Church, this happens with the Vatican Councils in the 60s. But there's a movement even within the Protestant Church to have something more enveloping, more in the round, where the congregation sits around the altar. Sarnan builds a great example of it at the First Christian Church in Columbus, Indiana. He worked with his father on another church in Columbus, but this was done totally on his own. And this kind of space needle church is ubiquitous in many, many, many suburban areas. This is one of the first prototypes of that particular kind of style. And again, a sort of totally enveloping interior. And then there's, of course, the Miller House itself. Saarinen had gone to college with J. Irwin Miller and designs this spectacular house with him, for him. It's a collaboration between Aero Saarinen and the senior designer in the office, Kevin Roach. Uh, the landscape is by the landscaper Dan Kiley. It's one of the most, to be honest with you, I've always thought the house is good. I've thought the interior is really good. The landscape is really great. It kind of domesticates the prairie in many ways and also takes the French LA, you can see it here, it takes the French LA idea that you normally enter with the gravel and the trees in, a ro in rows. You normally enter the French LA in Paris on axis. Here you enter it in the middle. So it's been turned 90 degrees to parallel the house. Inside, it's one of the first examples of the conversation pit. The interior was done by Alexander Girard who worked closely with Mrs. Miller on the development of this remarkable kind of storage wall that you see in the back. And when House Beautiful magazine wrote about this, they described it as a contemporary Palladian villa. And here again is that desire on the part of the press to find meanings to these buildings to conflate the American and the modern and something historical. The Palladian reference comes because it is kind of a nine grid plan. It's pretty difficult to see the Palladianism in it. Uh, and the office has always denied that. But the press, again, and architecture is oftentimes about the meanings given to it beyond the architect's purview. This is called a contemporary Palladian villa. Now, I want to talk more, the second half, about Sarnin's collaborations. Uh, as I mentioned, he came from Finland. This is him with his father on the left. The family came in the 20s. 
<clears throat> and the entire family was very, very talented. The mother, Loya Sarnan, was a weaver. Uh, the sister was a designer. And they were brought to Cranbrook. They were brought to Detroit. And they were hired to create a school which still exists called Cranbrook, which is outside of Detroit. It's in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. And if you ever get a chance to see it, it's a remarkable experience. The Sarnan family designs everything. It's a kind of masterpiece of the arts and crafts moving into the Art Deco. The house is designed by them. All the school buildings are designed by them. The doorknobs, the furniture, the light fixtures. In fact, Sarnan designs the, 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 um, the chairs in the girls' dormitory. And he's like a teenager at the time. So he's already working with his father. And I think this idea of working in collaboration begins with how the family sees architecture and interior design and landscape as holistic. They see everything connected from the dinnerware all the way up to the landscape. But they also see it as something which you work with other people to do this. Interestingly, in Saarinen's case, of course, as he got larger and took on larger and larger commissions, he was smart enough to know that he couldn't do it like his father did and working with the collaboration. Or with, they couldn't do it the way they did at Cranbrook. And so as a result, he moves beyond that and he starts to work with the best engineers, the best landscape architects. So he takes this idea of collaboration from the family, and he expands it to the professional realm. Not everything was happy in the Saarinen family. This is Eliel, the father, in the middle, arrow on the right, and the brother-in-law, Robert Swanson. Robert Swanson was an architect who married Saarinen's sister, and the Sarnans were very artistically minded, and they were not interested in business. Bob Swanson was far more interested in business, and there was a rupture in the family to the point that the brothers and the sister didn't speak to each other much. There was an explosion that blew the family apart. In the archive at Yale, there is an example of this photograph in which... Uh, there's a knife, there's a scissor cut through here. Swanson has literally been cut out. And if you turn the photograph around, on this side of the photograph it says, when using this image, use only this side. So things were not always so Nirvana-like. Uh, far happier were the relations that Sarnan had with his fellow Cranbrook colleagues. By the mid-1930s, Cranbrook, because of Eliel Sarnan, is the place to study design. And some of the great American designers come from Cranbrook in the 1930s. One of them is Charles Eames, who meets his wife, Ray Kaiser, there and goes off to California to become Charles and Ray Eames. Uh, Sarnan and Eames, who you see here, Sarnan's on the right. Eames is on the, no, yeah, uh, Sarnan's on the left. And, and no, Saarinen's on the right, Eames is on the left, turned around. Uh, they work together, and in 19, around 1940, they enter a competition at the Museum of Modern Art in New York called the Organic Design and Home Furnishings Competition. They win two first places. One of them is for this molded plywood furniture, which you see here. And out of that furniture, that's the DNA of much of the furniture you see today, after the war, the Eameses go on to work with Herman Miller to create such plywood furniture. Most of it's still in production. And Sarnan goes on to create his, whole, his own line of furniture. He does so with a woman named Florence Knoll. She was Florence Schust. She comes to school at Cranbrook and becomes almost like an adopted daughter within the Sarnan family. Uh, later in life, she marries a man named Hans Knoll, who has a furniture company, and creates the Knoll Furniture Company, which still exists. And all of Saarinen's furniture is produced with her and with Knoll. Here you see the two of them studying the tulip chair. And I've always loved this advertisement. I think it's something from the early 70s. Advertising was very important, and the advertising mag designer was very important person in the field. Uh, this is an advertisement by Herbert Matter, who was a great graphic designer. And the way this ad worked was, if you saw it in a magazine, you'd see the image on the left, and then you would turn the page, and as if the paper had come off, you'd see the image on the right. 
There is even one version of it where the image on the left is kind of on frosted paper, so you can actually see the image behind it on the page below, and then you lift the frosted paper and you unwrap the chair. They did store windows. Uh, this is sawn and furniture in the Carson Perry Scott store in Chicago, where the furniture is treated as pieces of suspended sculpture. And finally, sarn and furniture even reached the mainstream. Uh, on the right, Santa Claus is enveloped in a sarn and womb chair. And on the, sorry, on the left, and on the right is a Norman Rockwell cover from the Saturday Evening Post, where the father is using the chair to hide as his family is going off to church on a Sunday morning. Uh, the office was also a very, very intense place. Um, I've talked to people who work there. Uh, people would say to Sarnin on January 1st, don't you know it's New Year's Day? Shouldn't we be home with our family? And he'd say, what for? So the office seems to have been open 365 days a year, uh, 24 hours a day. He was an intense workaholic. Some people feel that may have been the cause of the brain tumor, that he short-circuited his mind in many ways with this intense amount of work. Uh, here, there they are working. They're working on the model here of Dulles Airport. And you can see what I mentioned earlier, the kind of collaborative nature uh, of the work process. That there's a, they're using this big model not only to study the forms, but also to kind of talk to each other and work out the issues. Photography was also a very important tool. This is a photograph on the right by a man who becomes a very well-known architecture photographer named Balthazar Korab, who is working within the Saarinen office and is taking photographs. It's a kind of study of the abstract nature of some of the columns at TWA. So they're not just working, but they're also kind of experimenting with looking at the forms in a new way, using photography as a tool to study the new forms and to do kind of stop motion animation. Here is, this is a model of the TWA terminal. And if you look closely, you can see outside the window is the photographer lighting the shoot. I think this is Balthazar Korab himself. And they would actually use smoke and mirrors. So they would use a mirror to double the size and give it its full size. They only built half. And they would puff in cigarette smoke to make it appear a larger space. So it's a very sort of theatrical approach to architecture. Things might have been somewhat intense in the office. There was a man named Claude DeForest who did these on his own, these somewhat malicious drawings that let off steam, perhaps. Uh, this is a joke about somebody walking through the curving spaces at TWA. And the final collaborator I want to talk about is Aline Saarinen. Aline Saarinen was Aero Saarinen's second wife. Uh, she is a very fascinating figure. She was a critic, at the, an art critic at the New York Times, a very educated woman, and she was assigned to write the first big article on Aero Saarinen in the New York Times. It has the, I love the, the fantastically portentous, now Saarinen, the son. Almost like now Jesus, the son. <laughs> because Eliel has just died, and she goes to interview Aero Saarinen. Their romance, even though Aero is married, their romance begins that night. And within a few years, uh, he divorces his first wife, and he marries Aline. Aline is also the author of a bestseller at the time called The Proud Possessors. And it's a book about the mix of money and taste and art and power. People like Duveen, Bernard Berenson, the great critic with whom she actually studied, Morgan in New York, Freer, the various mix. And in many ways, Eero Saarinen found the kind of woman he needed in Aline. He wanted to be one of those people of culture, and Aline definitely knew that world and knew how it worked. She was from New York, so it was a way to have, she had 
firsthand knowledge of all the New York outlets. The letter on the right is something from the archive. I tell you, don't donate your papers to the Archives of American Art because they s digitize everything and you find out all kinds of fascinating things. This is a remarkable drawing, a chart, that Arrow is supposedly written in which he's rating the various women he's dating. And he rates them by heart, head, I can't think of the others, what are the others? There's two others, and there is X, Y, and Z, and if you notice the first line is Aline, and Aline wins. Whether it's meant as a joke or whether he was seriously doing it, it's hard to know, but the archive has very interesting letters to various people about how the first wife didn't work out as planned, she was too much of a homebody, I need somebody who can really promote and make me the kind of cultural figure I want to be, and Aline was definitely that person. Uh, at the time of his death in 1961, she appears with, uh, uh, at the TWA terminal, uh, being interviewed by John Chancellor on NBC. She has a very successful career at NBC. She does a television program that's kind of Barbara Walters before Barbara Walters. Uh, she goes on to a very interesting career as a journalist, but she really knew from a media standpoint, she knew how the world worked. Uh, he was even photographed for Vogue magazine uh, on the left by none other than the great fashion photographer Irving Penn. The article is written by Aline Saarinen. And there's a funny little note at the bottom that says it's about four architects who are reshaping America. They're all photographed by Irving Penn. And Aero Saarinen is one of them. And there's a little note at the bottom that says, to the reader, uh, it is true that the author of this article has recently married one of the four architects. However, she picked him before she married him. They felt, but she then quit the New York Times, and this is opening the door to the great architecture critic, Edelweiss Huxtable. When Aline leaves, Edelweiss Huxtable kind of steps in and owes, in many ways, her career to Aline marrying Aero Saarinen. And on the right is a shoot for Harper's Bazaar at uh, MIT. So you can see, not only is, he, is his furniture in Coca-Cola ads and Saturday Evening Post, but he's being featured in magazines way beyond the sort of typical architectural journals. These are the architects who create New York's Lincoln Center. Uh, they're standing in the model of Lincoln Center. Aero Sarnin is seated. Uh, you can see he's seated with the glasses on in the front. And there's also Philip Johnson and Nelson Rockefeller and varieties of other architects. These are the architects who, in many ways, represent the second generation of modern architects. If Elio Sarnin and Mies van der Rohe and Frank Lloyd Wright are the first generation, Aero Sarnin and Philip Johnson are very much the second generation of modern architects. And in many respects, uh, Saarinen spoke for this group of architects that he's sitting amongst in this model. He spoke for this group of architects when he talked about how the earlier generation, that would be the generation of his father and Mies and Corbusier and Frank Lloyd Wright, how they created what the younger Saarinen called the measly ABCs of modern design and modern architecture. And he uses that term, the measly ABCs. And to Zarnin, the job of the modern architect of his generation was to go beyond those measly ABCs and to add more and more letters to the alphabet of architecture to make it technologically and structurally and formally and from a standpoint of meaning to make it richer and more complex. This is why in many respects I have often felt this seems to almost be that search that he's doing, why each building has to have something new in its technology, a new form. There's something new at each time because what he's doing is he's building up this alphabet of modern design. He's adding more letters furiously throughout the 1950s in all of these buildings. But because he died at the age of 51, Sarnin's capacity to complete that search was cut short. And we'll never know how his architecture would have evolved and how it would have matured. But in the short time he had, roughly a decade, 1950 to 1961, 
Sarnen was able to create a remarkable body of architectural design that resonates with many of the themes of architecture today. Here I'm thinking of his use of new technologies to create innovative forms, his embrace of the media, and the highly collaborative nature of his office. Thus, the formal and the technical and the experimental dimensions of Sarnen's work teach us not only how architecture shapes the culture of its own time, but also the culture of future generations. Thank you. <laughs>